Here are three really fantastic history books that have kind of reshaped the way that I see the world around me, as so many history books manage to do. All three of these are history books that you absolutely need to read. If you love the feeling of history books actually morphing your mind and reshaping your relationship to the world itself, these are three books that you need to go out and read right now. We'll start with The Language Puzzle by Stephen Mithen. This copy was sent to me by Profile Books and I was so, so happy to check this out. I'm not a professional linguist, but linguistics is something that I care deeply about. It's something that I am perpetually fascinated by. I love etymology. I have fervently studied several languages, including Mandarin and Japanese. I find linguistics an endlessly fascinating thing. A few years ago, I read a really amazing book called Don't Believe a Word by David Shariat Madari. That book really stuck with me and I urge you to check that out as well, but let's talk here about the language puzzle. Stephen Mithen is an archaeologist who has written several books over the last few decades. This newest one, The Language Puzzle, draws on so many different disciplines. There is obviously archaeology in here, but there's also neurobiology, evolutionary biology, linguistics, etymology, social sciences, and even more besides. This is a multidisciplinary history book that has drawn on so much research, so much science, so many discoveries in order to piece together the language puzzle. The story of how we started speaking. This is a book that draws on many different disciplines in order to answer the question, how, when, and why did we start speaking? Where did language come from? This must have been an enormous undertaking, and I am so impressed by it. The first thing that I was impressed by is how it is presented. This is not by any means a heavy book, at least in terms of how it's written, and how everything is presented to you. No matter how much you know about history, biology, linguistics, you're not gonna struggle with this book. He is very good at communicating to his audience in a very clear way without being patronizing and without losing any of the depth and density of what he's talking about. After its introduction, the next chapter gives us a brief history of humankind. It's a very, very swift run through of our evolutionary steps. It talks a lot about our last common ancestor with other apes. Our closest cousins are chimpanzees, most people know that. And our last common ancestor existed about six million years ago. From that point, as so often happens, evolutionary branches start to grow. One of those branches led to Homo sapiens, us. Other branches led to different kinds of chimpanzees, and along the way there were branches that died, like Neanderthals. Later in the book he explores whether or not our last common ancestor had language, whether or not Neanderthals had language. If not, when did language start and how did it develop? And from here we build and we build and we grow and we grow. The book also goes into the biology of the human brain, the biology of our ear, the biology of our throat and how we make sounds, our vocal folds, the shapes of our mouths and tongues. Very little is left unexplored here. In fact, I can't think of anything. There is so much that will blow your mind about how language formed. So many facts, so many tidbits that you will share with your friends. Did you know this about language? Did you know that? For example, about halfway through the book, Mytham refers to Plato. Plato had this idea that originally all language was what we call iconic, where every single word meant something and was connected to the world around us. The most obvious example of iconic words in linguistics are onomatopoeia, words that we say which sound like the thing they're describing. Splash and crash and bang and onomatopoeia are iconic words. But there are loads more. Plato's idea lasted a long time, but it wasn't anything that people could back up. And in the early 20th century, it was kind of dismissed. Since then, however, iconic language has turned out to be a real thing. So many nouns especially are iconic. When you look at all the world's languages, there are specific sounds that get repeated. For example, in so many of the world's languages, when talking about something small, the noun for that small thing, or the adjective describing it, will have an i or e sound to it. Vowels that are created at the front of the mouth that denotes smallness almost unconsciously. Likewise, we have words like huge and tall. These words describe bigness, and the vowels in those words are created further at the back of your mouth. And this is found across all languages. These are iconic words. It's 
fascinating. The idea that as we trace language back further, we get these iconic sounds. Early in the book, he talks about chimpanzees and monkeys, and how there are certain sounds that they make that relate to certain things like danger or food. And there are suffixes that monkeys add to the end of a word to denote whether or not that danger is happening now, or you can see something on the horizon that might be dangerous soon. They will actually add a suffix. Panic now, or maybe panic soon. <laughs> Absolutely incredible stuff. I could go on and on and on. There are so many facts and details in here that wowed me. I learned so much about our cousins. I learned so much about our history and our biology and our social relationships to one another. This is a mind-blowing history book. Please check it out. And now I'm gonna gush all over again about this history book. Femina, or to give it its full title, A New History of the Middle Ages Through the Women Written Out of It. This is by Dr. Janina Ramirez, and oh my goodness. Now Ramirez is a researcher and lecturer at Oxford, and this is a brand new history of the European Middle Ages. The way that it's structured is absolutely brilliant. We begin in the introduction with a story about Emily Davison, the very famous militant suffragette who tragically died when she was run over by the king's horse. Pretty much everyone knows that story, but what a lot of people don't know is that Emily Davison was a medievalist. She was a very accomplished academic, and she believed that there was a lot that we could learn about how women were treated, how women behaved, the roles and rights of women in the Middle Ages that we could bring to the present day. Now, I read this after reading Caliban and the Witch, which I'll talk about in a second, but that book kind of supported that idea. I learned so much about how women behaved and the rights of women in the Middle ages that really, really shocked me. And this book only re-emphasized that a hundred times over. Now, the Middle Ages lasted about a thousand years. The early Middle Ages are what's known as the Dark Ages, where we don't have a lot of written records, and that was around the 5th century. So the Middle Ages lasted roughly from the 5th to the 15th century. And this book traces all of the medieval period across a lot of Europe, starting in England and then moving over to Sweden, Germany, France, and beyond. The book is mostly about the great women of this period who are unsung heroes of so many different disciplines, but it's also a book that very smartly corrects so much about history that we misunderstand, most obviously being the Vikings. When you say Viking, there are certain images that pop into your head, and almost none of them are correct. When we think of Vikings, we so rarely picture women, and that is absurd. And so there is a whole chapter about Vikings, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. As I said, the structure of this book is very, very smart. Each chapter focuses on roughly a century of the Middle Ages, and we jump forward a hundred years with each chapter, but we also jump from country to country with each chapter, and we jump from discipline to discipline. Each chapter focuses on a different kind of woman, or even just a different kind of person. There are rulers, there are scientists, there are philosophers, theologians, artists, writers, historians, spies. Every kind of interesting discipline is explored here. You will learn about incredible female scientists of the Middle Ages, amazing female artists. In fact, the chapter on artists talks about the Bayer Tapestry. We often don't think about who created it, which is absurd. The Bayer Tapestry is a masterpiece, and it was created by a group of women who never get talked about, who never got any credit. These were English women who created the tapestry in Canterbury, England. I didn't know that. I've seen the Bayer Tapestry. When I was a teenager, I went to Bayer, I saw the tapestry, it was gorgeous. I never thought about who made it. Why does no one talk about it? Patriarchy. Also, each chapter begins with the word discovery, and it talks about a specific moment sometime usually within the last hundred years, where a scientist or an archaeologist made a discovery of some kind that shook the world and changed what we thought we knew about the Middle Ages. These discoveries are often really, really interesting. They might happen at archaeological dig sites, or they might be something more dangerous than that. For example, there's one chapter about a German woman with the help of an American friend who just after World War II saved and preserved a very, very important medieval text. This text was the completed and almost entire works of an amazing German philosopher, theologian, historian, scientist, and many other things. She was an amazing polymath. 
Her name was Hildegard of Bingen, and in that chapter, we learn everything about her. Ramirez makes the bold and accurate claim that the only other European polymath in history that we know of who was as accomplished as Hildegard was Leonardo da Vinci. Now, we all know about da Vinci. Why don't we know about Hildegard? Patriarchy. Da Vinci was an artist, an inventor, but he very rarely actually finished the things he started. Hildegard did. She did so many incredible things with her life that we do not know about, we do not learn about, and it's all in here. As is, as I already said, so much history about the Vikings, who they really were, and the fact that they were a pretty gender-equal society, with many of their most accomplished warriors being women. I could go on and on, I could recite all of this, I have to be careful not to, but if you want to know a real history of the European Middle Ages, that includes, highlights, and celebrates all of the forgotten women, the scientists, leaders, warriors, and artists, absolutely check out Femina. It's amazing. Also, there is a chapter at the very end which talks about transgender people of the Middle Ages as well, and as a trans person, I really, really appreciated Ramirez for including this. The things I learned about trans history in the European Middle Ages was amazing, and I'm so glad that she put that in. There is a disgusting lie that politicians, especially in the UK and the US, are touting right now, that being trans is a new thing, a fad, a trend, and a dangerous one. And in here, we learn all about the trans people of the Middle Ages. I really appreciate that. And finally, we have Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici. I've already done a dedicated video on this book, so I'm not gonna say much about it here, but this is such an important text that I felt it bad repeating. If you wanna check that video out, it is pretty long, and it is pretty much everything I learned from this book. Lots and lots of quotes, so many eye-opening moments, I put a lot into that video, so I'd appreciate you checking it out. But to summarize what Caliban and the Witch is here, this is also a pretty multidisciplinary book. It's a book about theology, economics, political philosophy, and most importantly, history. The book's thesis is an exploration of the relationship between capitalism and patriarchy. In a lot of ways, this is kind of a follow-up to the writings of Karl Marx, but from a feminist angle that looks at the role of women and how the role of women changed from the Middle Ages into the modern era, and how the rise of capitalism destroyed women, destroyed ethnic minorities as well, and reinforced the power of white men. How women's bodies became commodified by capitalism, and they still are to this day. We begin in the Middle Ages with serfs and all of the attempts they had to rise up against their lords and masters, especially the heretic movement. When you say heretic, there are certain things that pop into your head, but the heretics were a fascinating group of people, arguably the first communists. They were a Christian group who were led by their beliefs to try and create a communist utopia of sorts. And this is before capitalism even really existed. From there, we get into the rise of capitalism and how patriarchy shifted, changed, became more powerful, and the role of the woman, the rights of the woman, changed over time across Europe, and this eventually even led to the witch hunts. In this book, Caliban is the ethnic minority, and the witch is the woman, and how these two groups, women and ethnic minorities, were oppressed, stripped bare, and used as tools by patriarchy and capitalism, which essentially are one and the same. I'll stop there, you can go check out my full video, but I couldn't not mention this book here, because if you really want a history book that will change how you see everything, how you see patriarchy and how you see capitalism, and those two things rule our entire world, this is the book you need to read. Caliban and the Witch really will change you forever. These three history books, each in their own way, has taught me so much about evolution, about modern history, about politics, about so many different things. I am very, very grateful. Through these three books, I have learned so much so quickly that it's almost dizzying, and I cannot recommend them enough. Check them out and subscribe for books.